thank you so much, uh, BODW, for inviting us uh, this year, and thank you all for, uh, for showing up today. Kibisi uh, consists of uh, three different companies. It's a collaboration between uh, Kilo Design, uh, Big Architects, and Skipster Ideation. So this is the three partners, the key, the B, and the C. Uh, Skipster Ideation are creators of the Biomega brand. They have uh, designers such as Mark Newsom and uh, Russ Lovegrove in their portfolio. Uh, so they are creators of, uh, of the brand. Uh, Skipster Ideation and Jens Martin Skipster is also a writer. He did the, the book Instant Icon on uh, how to create exceptional values out of products and how they're made. He's also a member of the World Economic uh, Forum. He's uh, vice chair of the Global uh, Agenda Council on Design and Innovation. He's also a contributor and writer for a series of international magazines. Bjarke is uh, also a writer, uh, uh, along being architect. He did uh, the book Yes is More on uh, architectural evolution. It's an archie comic on, uh, on evolution. Uh, best known uh, for uh, a trilogy of housing in Copenhagen, uh, the VM houses uh, to the left. Uh, let's just go back. The VM houses to the left and the mountain to the right. So uh, the, the, the V houses has this uh, huge glass facade with cantilevering balconies uh, on this side. Um, this is the mountain. This is a, a combination of uh, an urban colorful inside for parking and an outside of uh, sloping um, apartments on the top of the building. And then there is the eight house, uh, a, a, a figure eight building, uh, kind of like a small mountain village where you can ride your bike or walk all the way from ground level to uh, the top of the building. Uh, big recently opened up. Uh, an uh, U.S. Uh, office and building a high-rise uh, on Manhattan, a hybrid of a uh, Manhattan skyscraper and a traditional uh, Scandinavian uh, perimeter block, a court scraper uh, facing the Hudson River. I'm educated architect and product designer, uh, and I, I actually used to work for Bjarke. Uh, I have a series of projects behind me on uh, installation, uh, more strategic implementation of uh, design, and more down to detail, uh, nerdy industrial stuff. So we are three guys. We are a product designer, a brand engineer, and an architect. And we merge product, brand, and architecture into one. This is what our portfolio, some of it, uh, ranging from very small in-ear headphones <coughs> over bikes, uh, urban mobility, uh, upholstery, and urban installation. Yeah, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the ideas behind our product. We have two fundamental beliefs uh, in Kibisi. One is that um, good design comes out of big ideas or strong ideas. Um, and the other one is that these ideas uh, are evolutionary in nature. So uh, when uh, we formed the company, Lars told me, check out Bjarke's TED Talk. And I was like, why would I sit and watch in a small video screen when he's in front of me? Uh, but you know, end of the day, I did watch it, and it was great. And to my surprise, he was talking about uh, uh, how he saw design as an evolutionary thing, you know, how at least his approach to design was evol evolutionary. And uh, he mentioned uh, Darwin, you know, that basically the most adaptable uh, designs the most adaptable to change are those that uh, survive. And um, so, yeah, so he, he, he had this in his speech, and you could see how uh, some uh, designs kind of branch off, mutate, some die, some survive. Uh, and here is uh, how that, uh, that those kind of iterations work out for him as an, uh, as an architect. And it really surprised me because um, the book that uh, Lars just mentioned that I wrote was about uh, the evolutionary nature of design. So, okay, that, that's, a, that's a coincidence. And uh, by the way, the, the, the strong idea in this case became uh, like the idea that you also have in the Spanish step, steps in Rome, how uh, the uh, stairway can become the, the foundation uh, of a high rise. So, uh, 
the, the thing with this evolutionary approach in terms of its um, iterations was slightly different from uh, what I had been uh, thinking about. And um, also, I didn't totally agree with the fact that it was Darwinistic. Actually, it's more uh, like Lamarck's type of, um, of uh, evolutionary approach where things don't necessarily die off because these designs are stuck and kept and uh, reutilized as we also in Kibisi uh, stock our designs. And um, so, so basically, there's no final life of a design. There's kind of a, a stage where it grows into something new. Uh, the, the kind of a approach that uh, I had been looking more uh, into was uh, this, that design is idea-led. So strong uh, ideas tend to survive. And uh, I used a guy who's also self-proclaimed Darwinist, uh, Richard Dawkins uh, theory, who uh, also most people think is a, a Lamarckian and not Darwinist, but um, he had this thing that, um, Although when we think of evolution, we think of something biological, it can be applied to other orders. So there is an order which, in where ideas struggle for survival, and they have the same characteristics. So you have variation, so, uh, selection, and inheritance. So, so variation is, for instance, I, have, um, uh, I dance the polka or I dance the electric boogie. If um, people prefer the electric boogie, then electric boogie is selected, and polka risk dying. Uh, then it can be inherited, and it can also mutate, you know, so it can become breakdance and so on. So, so that's an idea of a dance, and that kind of approach we also uh, could say uh, design has, that you have different possibilities, and some get selected, and some get passed on. Uh, so, so basically with this, he calls this theory the theory of meme, not to be confused with uh, web memes, that, uh, that we actually not... Uh, necessarily the ones that always create ideas, they just live in our brains and uh, go from one brain to the other. The strong ideas, they survive in our brains. So uh, I'm gonna try and exemplify how does that translate into design. So here's uh, the, uh, the, the Copenhagen bike. Uh, and here what we did, we took um, the ideogram, if you like, or at least the um, uh, the, the, the pictogram or the, the icon of a bicycle. So how can we go down to the essence of a bike? Then we, we looked at different things that we wanted to include. Here we have the Danish motorcycle Nimbus, which uh, does not exist uh, as, uh, as a company anymore, but they had this, um, they used this cadenic shaft. So we, we took some elements from there. At, at the time it was designed, the Californian mountain bikes were starting to uh, take over, over streets. And um, people started riding them in the, in the cities because they look cool, but they did not work well in cities. So we also had to take some properties from ordinary city bikes. And then we looked at cars, that they, they were the ones that were really successful in the city space. How could we uh, do some of the stuff that they did? How could we take some of their success away? So uh, one property that they have is that uh, they are highly recognizable. So you can easily see what brand, what make a car is without reading the logo uh, on the car. That is not the case with uh, bikes. These are crappy bikes, but you can take the most beautiful Italian bicycles. If you remove the logo, you still have no clue uh, who made that bike. So uh, the, the other thing uh, with the, the bike industry was that it was celebrating complexity. And also, uh, you had brands all over the place, and you can't really start branding a thing before it's one thing. So uh, therefore, uh, to solve these, we, tr we try to simplify and we also try to integrate. So basically, we had all of these elements, all these uh, memes, if you like, and we created a memeplex and had that one uh, product at the end of it. So that was one approach to uh, the evolutionary thing. The other approach was the one that uh, I mentioned that uh, Big also utilizes with the constant iterations where the strong one survives. This is a lamp for Louis Paulson that uh, Lars will tell you a little bit more about. And this is tons of shapes that we went through, iterations of shapes. And all the tests uh, ended up here, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about why. So we were actually asked uh, to Louis Paulson to design a, a fixture that would uh, fit into most uh, architectural spaces. And we decided that looked into or could kind of range from, uh, from classic architecture to more conceptual uh, and modern architecture. 
Also implementing uh, all the brand values and the uh, production know-how uh, of, uh, of Louis Paulsen. Uh, here the Eclipta lamp by Arne Jacobsen. Uh, and we actually decided to start out with a round shape, uh, mainly because round shapes uh, work in uh, kind of many constellations here on a line, and here random. Uh, and then we kind of uh, asked the architects around, and we figured out that architects in general try to uh, implement light in their buildings, and they don't really want to use fixtures. Uh, but if they can't do that, there is no uh, kind of way out. So how do we make things pop out of architecture? Uh, we looked into mirrors. That would be one way of doing it. Uh, also, nature is pretty good at doing this. Uh, and we also looked at how things touch each other. Um, and here we get back to where the iterations before ended up. Uh, this uh, tension uh, in a water drop, uh, a shape that uh, led us to the lamp uh, that is called silver bag. It's called silver bag because it has a backside that mirrors uh, the surface that you put it on. Uh, it consists of a kind of uh, a fix that, uh, or a, a fixture that goes on the wall, a back part that is uh, a silver, uh, semi, sem semi translucent uh, back plate, and then uh, a, a front cover that is uh, opaque white. So all these things uh, assembly into being one lamp, and the tubes. Let's see if this works. The tubes, they shine out through the op opaque front, but they also reflect to the back part, creating a halo around the lamp, making a, or a glare reduction, uh, we also call it. Here, it is, uh, it's fitted with the tubes. It will come in an LED version uh, beginning of next year. So here you see it with light in, where it uh, easily blends into the surface uh, that it uh, sits on. This little movie uh, on the lamp. So basically here you 
had some of these elements that uh, you, you had the, the, the water drop that in, was inspiring in terms of shape. You also had a, com a communication part, which was like a, kind of the reference to the, the silverback gorilla, but also uh, in terms of uh, Louis Paulson, the brand, the, the ideas lend themselves very well to communicate a brand. Uh, functions and forms don't really. Uh, they are kind of subsidiaries of the idea. And uh, to this brand particularly, the halo effect is, is incredibly important. And I think kind of this um, adapting to the background without really being the background, that was uh, the, 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 the lead idea on this. So uh, we move on to headphones. We've designed a series of headphones for Danish brand III, uh, full family. First one being the Swirl. Uh, at this time, most, uh, most uh, in-ear headphones had like slim wires. We decided to buff it up and introduce a Swirl in the beginning. Uh, it was actually the CIA Swirl from the CIA agent and it evolved through the process and is now a flexible part, uh, more functional than the lower part. But overall, we worked on this uh, coherency on, a, on the product and the relation between the different components, making them uh, familiar. Uh, this is a more uh, feminine version, a slimmer wire, and uh, it's called the pipe because of the shape of the, the, the housing unit. But again, we use the same components uh, that we did for the other one, creating this relation in family. This is Trax. It's a, a lightweight on-ear uh, on uh, headphone inspired by the, you could say, the, the 80s Walkman culture. Uh, trying to frame that into a very simple, iconic product where the small connector is easily slided in and out of the brace, and also, and the little connector can you can remove it, uh, and it comes in different colors in the box for personal customization. Uh, this is TMA One. This is a professional tool for DJs, uh, and it's designed in close collaboration uh, uh, between design uh, designers, sound engineers, uh, technicians, and uh, DJs. I think there's been a, a, a crowd of uh, close to 30 international DJs being part of this project all the way through. And the whole idea was to create a, you could say, actually taking uh, these guys serious. Uh, they're doing a serious piece of work while we are getting battered, battered on, the, on the dance floor. So as the carpenter has a drill, we would create a, a headphone uh, for the DJs. So it's a, an, an, an overall, uh, overall very iconic, seen as a, as a full unit, uh, and one kind of uh, simple design language uh, defining the full full product. Uh, we also did a technical solution uh, for, the, for the connection between brace and cup. It's, uh, it's inspired by uh, the, the systems that you would work, use on crutches that you would get in hospital if you break your leg. And uh, it, has, it has no logos on, uh, it, or they are embedded on the inside of the product, so the outside is totally simple, only defining the product. Uh, also left and right symbols on the inside. It has a, a technical build-up with a, with, a, with a felt acoustic inside, a, a 40 millimeter driver and a, and, a, and a top cover. And then it comes with interchangeable cushions for individual fit. This is a, a MoMA collected uh, product and it's at Museum of Modern Art, Art in San Francisco. Uh, talking about evolution, this one, like an, a step up for this product uh, was to buff up, actually built on the same DNA, but buffing up the, the, to being an over-ear uh, headphone, and also the, the brace, the comfort uh, in the brace uh, has, has increased so that it's uh, easy, easily used for studio production. This is made for, for kind of producers on the go. The uh, latest product is uh, Capital. Uh, Capital is uh, designed for the urban island being on the go, uh, getting around the, the city. It's easily foldable uh, and uh, fits, uh, and it's uh, hooked up the wire. You interlock it with the wire, and the wire clicks into the, to, to the product itself. So again, looking at this overall evolutional uh, picture, there is the kind of the brand values embedded in the product. There is this uh, this uh, reference to 2D graphics that you would know from posters in the city. There is the, the curl up or the roll up of the wire. There is the interlocking system that uh, you would see here on the brace. It's inspired by technical uh, solutions on cycling shoes. The uh, folding up bike has inspired to the fold up of the product. And, uh, and then some of the materials are digged out from the city. So the, the headband is a, a cell rubber that is also used for, for bike handles. And the, and the foam for the, for the cushions is actually 
uh, taken from uh, car seats. And as Bjarke uh, used to say, if it's uh, good enough for your ass, it's good enough for your ears. So we've made a ton of uh, bikes for uh, different manufacturers. This, these are for um, Puma, and this is actually the original uh, Puma bike. The, I mean, there, there are plenty of things to note uh, about it. Uh, it's foldable, but the, the cable that goes down, the, the down tube, is not only a down tube, uh, it's also a lock. So basically, you can unlock that, lock it on a, uh, on a pole or whatever, and in case it gets cut, you break the, the structural integrity of the bike. So uh, we, we, we expanded that to a whole family. So as you see, there are some brand traits that, uh, that uh, run through. It's uh, still foldable. But then we introduced a new uh, theme, kind of the, the transportational theme. So we integrated a handlebar and, um, and carrier into one object. This is a fixie type bike. Here you have the, the handlebar uh, again integrated. And here, there's the transportation theme going through. We also uh, done a lot of bikes for Biomega. And um, in this case, uh, the idea is that you have these two molds on each side in carbon fiber. And uh, they um, integrate the, um, uh, yeah, well, for, for, for one, these two molds allow you to put different size of aluminum between them, these two carbon fiber parts, so you get many sizes. And as well, we've integrated the, the, the lighting in there, so they are mudguard, fork, and light integrated into one piece. So uh, what, what you end up having, again, is a kind of a, uh, you, you have some, some brand values that go through this kind of this whole um, uh, emulating the car that you have from, from all of the Biomega, bark, uh, Biomega bikes. You have the Mark Newson bike, and the Kibisi designed uh, bike here that we try to kind of find a, a mutual ground in terms of uh, uh, form expression. And then, of course, you have a lot of uh, constructive elements. And all of these ideas kind of go into making this. And going from integrated lights to uh, external lights, uh, we recently uh, launched these bike lights that uh, fit uh, all bikes. They go on, uh, on either the, uh, the seat post or the handlebar. And uh, they are magnetic, uh, so that when you, uh, when you take your light and add it on your bike, it will uh, start, uh, the, the light automatically uh, lights on. And the two parts also fit together, uh, so that you get one unit out of the product when, uh, when you don't use it. Uh, front and rear. So, and again, uh, implementing also, like uh, bike lights has, has this tendency to be very, become very technical often. So this was also tried to, uh, we designed it with a, an overall holistic approach, trying to merge everything into one thing. It also has this lifestyle element of, uh, of being available in different colors. Uh, so a small silicone uh, thing that is kind of locked on easily. Uh, and again, the overall evolutionary picture of this product looks like this. So uh, big design, the Danish Pavilion uh, in Shanghai for 2010, uh, and we it's continuous loop. They brought the, the Little Mermaid and uh, and the Danish bikes to uh, Shanghai, uh, and we were asked to design a, a chair for the Pavilion, and we decided to take uh, or design with a takeoff in, in this huge uh, installation or a bench that runs through the full Pavilion, and try to see what would a, uh, a chair look like uh, if it was just one small segment of uh, of that bench. So uh, four small boards easily folded around each other, uh, forming a, a, a simple and very iconic chair. 
So on one hand, uh, simple and iconic. On the other hand, really traditional. A chair with a, a leg, four legs, a, a back, and a seat. Used for conference facilities here below deck and here outside on, uh, on the pavilion uh, for dining. It has this built-in uh, feature that because it's flat pack, comes in a little box that if you buy different, uh, different chairs, you can also uh, design your own color hybrids uh, and personalize your chair. And again, an overall picture, the bench, the folding, the flat pack, the Danish uh, design furniture tradition, uh, the, uh, a reference to the, the, the Chinese uh, writing uh, in the, these uh, uh, white boards and the, all the combinations in the product. So uh, we were asked to design a, a sofa for Danish brand Versus. Uh, at this, this time, Bjarke couldn't find a sofa, so we actually used that uh, as a kickoff for designing a, a sofa, saying, like, what would the ultimate architectural sofa look like? So uh, we took off in the houses we live in, and the sofa is kind of built like a brick bond structure, uh, or big bond, a brick bond structure uh, with buttons uh, that uh, interlocks the full system. So uh, we did a concrete button and used this climbing wire uh, as a, a technical feature, giving the product uh, detail. So actually, a product with a facade, an architectural facade uh, from uh, from all sides. And again, the overall look up, the playfulness of Lego, the softness of bags, uh, the brick bond system, the concrete feel, and, uh, and the tailor-made uh, uh, connections. So uh, from one uh, element, the product to another, these uh, four, six boards uh, is actually a shelf. So what you see lying on the floor is actually the shelf standing here. So it's uh, collapsible, and depending on how many boards you buy, you can build your own uh, own designs uh, from this product, so small, medium, uh, large. And we also did a, a, an installation at the, this year's uh, Milan Fair with the Danish Design Center, this 16 meter long shelf. And again, it flat packs, it has the, uh, we wanted this tailor-made feel to it uh, and the combinations of, uh, of the product. Um, we wondered why uh, light bulbs, energy-saving light bulbs, mostly look like this. And when we were asked by Lightyear to design a pendant for them, we actually wanted it to look like that. Uh, so we designed this one, uh, Bulb Fiction, that uh, actually swallows the, uh, the energy-saving bulb into a, a simple, iconic shape, where, again, with an overall uh, holistic approach, be becoming one object, and here kind of a see-through of the product. And the build-up, also the wire is special. Uh, it's a, a fat silicone wire. The, the, you could say the product uh, was scaled up, and we also wanted not to use a standard wire because we thought that it didn't fit the product. Yeah, so I don't know if we've been able to convince you about our kind of evolutionary approach, but at least uh, one thing we do have in common with uh, Darwin is that we also uh, love making uh, foolish experiments and uh, keep making them. So um, our kind of approach to um, uh, s sustainability uh, that, that to us is an important part of design as well is, has been twofold. Uh, so one is this kind of a thing uh, that Bjarke talks a lot about, uh, hedonistic uh, sustainability, that basically sustainability is not going to go anywhere unless it's enjoyable to us. So this is a, um, a waste management plant where you can ski on top of it. So that's kind of the, the, the very abundant way you could approach sustainability. Uh, the, uh, another one that we've also been um, using is the aesthetic uh, sustainability, which is kind of a, a scarcity approach to it, the, which uh, is very uh, typical for where, from where we come from, where resources have been scarce. And so uh, uh, going to the airport, this uh, cab driver was telling me how he's rethreading this uh, Wegener white chair for his kids. So that's a very, very uh, sustainable approach. But uh, to us, we still felt we as a group had to evolve. So. Um, we thought, how could we not just uh, keep doing this, but go uh, away from this? So this uh, is an example of something that's sustainable, both in terms of very enjoyable, but also in terms of um, uh, that, that, that stays uh, on the market. It's not visually, it's not going to grow tired. You can still ride this bike in 30 years uh, without aesthetically being unpleased, because you're going to throw things out when they don't feel pleasing to you, no matter how long they last. So we thought, how could we kind of um, uh, 
think sustainability uh, at a more, um, well, how, could we, how could we rethink it? How could we personally evolve? And then we came up with this generosity principle that again can be understood um, uh, twofold. So once, if you, uh, one is that when you have um, a good design today, there are three parties that are happy. We as a designer are happy because we get paid. Our customer, the manufacturer, is happy because they have a successful product. And the customer is happy because they have a good product. So that's how uh, good design works today. So we thought, uh, could we make sure that every design now pleases some fourth element, some fourth person, some fourth institution? So uh, that was one way we thought. The other way was um, trying to change uh, one product into something new, basically adding to design history. Uh, so this is a flying truck we've, uh, uh, we've helped design. And um, so basically something uh, that goes from something that becomes something else. So uh, the last project we're gonna present you with is an example of how to implement both. Um, so the, the fourth element is the world now needs to see uh, design redefined, not as uh, just mercenaries for consumer culture, but also something that gives back. How can we uh, keep consuming without consuming too many material goods? So at least using less electri electricity is a good thing. Uh, having less weight when it gets shipped around is a good thing. Having um, uh, some kind of uh, physical engagement with this specific product makes sense. So uh, again, we took this evolutionary approach. We, uh, lend some stuff from a car jack, from a keyboard stand, and made uh, a table uh, out of it. And um, basically what we did, instead of having an electric, two electric motors going up and down, we just implemented a hand, hand crank to uh, do that for us. And again, we took all of these, you know, some analog elements and uh, created uh, one product here, uh, as you can see in our offices in uh, Copenhagen. So that was uh, the conclusion. So thank you for having us. And this is the product uh, being uh, lowered. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Lars and Martin. We have time for, for one question. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, I'm from Japan and I am a student of a university and I am studying a product design. Uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, do you think watching uh, or collecting vintage products will give good effect to having idea or inspiration for design? So, um, whether vintage products, uh, well I think well, in, in vintage products, what you can do, you can extrapolate from them. Of course, there's some kind of like specific heritage. There could be some Japanese heritage. Uh, even in terms of uh, the, the Vigna chair that was mentioned earlier today, uh, there's some Chinese uh, heritage being uh, conveyed in that. So, so that's one kind of way you can I extrapolate from them. Uh, as as uh, I was talking about earlier, the fact that many of these vintage pieces of furniture that they still exist means that uh, they're highly aesthetically sustainable, which uh, end of the day, if you consume less goods, it's good. And you actually consume a lot in terms of uh, monetary value because you pay more for them than you do for an Ikea chair or a cheap uh, plastic, uh, plastic molded chair. So <laughs> vintage furniture will not uh, by itself solve anything, but you can kind of use it to extrapolate from. You can. Um, uh, they, they, they can inspire you to go new directions and um, uh, and you have entire nations that the, these kind of simple thinking have um, helped. So for instance, uh, France, when they were uh, suffering from everybody else starting to make red wine, what they did, they started um, cultivating finer wines uh, and uh, going looking into the heritage. And basically it meant that although they uh, produced less uh, cubic tonnage of wine, they actually uh, got much more monetary value out of it. They just uh, had a higher turnover. So that's an, a way you can uh, be inspired by vintage um, furniture. I don't know if that quite answers your question. Um, yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, Martin. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Lars. Thank you.